Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we are just, I'm just waiting for folks to arrive so we can um, get uh, situated. Um, my name is Yvonne. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And um, I'm currently uh, in San Diego, but typically I am um, based in Tongva land or Los Angeles. Um, I'm really excited to about today's um, panel presentation. Um, I'm really excited about all the panelists that we have joining us today. Um, and i um, really glad that you're all here with us as well. So I'm noticing that there's a number of otter pilots that are joining us. We are in the age of the bots, I think, currently. And so I am going and removing the otter pilots uh, because I think, you know, we have concerns around privacy. And so um, if you are interested in uh, having notes uh, and getting a copy of the transcript and then also a copy of the recording, that will be available for folks uh, um, on our website. So you don't have to worry about having your otter uh, do that for you. Um, all right, so I think I think I think we're gonna get started. Um, I think there's one more uh, ASL person that uh, Emma, who I, I do not see yet, but um, I will keep my eye out for them and we'll add them as a panelist as soon as they join. Um, other than that, I want to welcome everyone to the third panel of the Municipalism Learning Series. And I will pause right now uh, for uh, consecutive interpretation by Alejandro. Hola, gracias por tenerme. Este, vamos a comenzar en un momento con la bienvenida para poder eh, comenzar. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the goal of the municipalism learning series is to introduce the framework of radical municipalism to a broad audience in North America. Y la meta de, de esta serie es poder presentar un marco eh, de municipios radicales aquí en North America. Uh, and we do this through uh, three offerings. We have we offer public panels, such as the one that we have today. We also have a fellowship program where uh, we are helping, um, you know, different thinkers and practitioners in municipalism develop strategies to win power. Um, and then uh, last, we are developing a series of long form articles. Um, exploring the intersection of municipalism with other uh, issues, including abolition and decolonization. Y queremos hacer esto por medio de eh, tres formas diferentes. Una de ellas es que estamos teniendo paneles públicos, tal como lo estamos haciendo el día de hoy. También estamos teniendo, eh, también tenemos un programa de pasantía para ayudar a, a personas a poder pensar en, en estrategias eh, municipales para aumentar el poder. Y también estamos teniendo artículos largos eh, donde exploramos más profundamente la intersección entre el, el, los municipios, la abolición y descolonización. Thank you. Uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, turn on interpretation. So um, in in your meeting controls, um, you should be able to see um, uh, a globe icon that says interpretation. Um, and if you uh, click on that, you once I turn it on, you will be able to see the um, language that you would like to hear, which you can then select once it's been turned on. And uh, Yvonne, is this where you want me to go ahead and jump into language justice and instructions in Spanish and, and continue from there or just and continue to just interpret what you, your last statement? Oh, that, uh, yes, your, your intro into language justice would be wonderful here. Awesome. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for having me. My name is Alejandro. Uh, as you can see, I am the uh, Spanish interpreter for this space. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share this in Spanish and then come back and repeat it in English to avoid having to interpret every other language, um, just to make it flow a little bit better for y'all. So thank you for your patience. Eh, hola a todos, mi nombre es Alejandro Arrieta. Seré el intérprete del inglés y del español en este espacio. Este, el día de hoy queremos practicar la justicia del lenguaje lo más posible. Eh, y como pueden ver, hemos, estamos usando varias herramientas para que eso suceda. Una de ellas es la traducción de los materiales en la presentación. Todo está escrito en inglés y en español. También estaremos usando la, la interpretación al español simultánea para el audio. Y también quiero, eh, en honor al, a la justicia del lenguaje, quiero mencionar también que tenemos aquí a, a Rey, que es un intérprete de señas americanos. Entonces, eh, para honrar los, los idiomas en el espacio, ¿no? Si ustedes prefieren escuchar en español específicamente, como pueden ver aquí en su pantalla, eh, un ejemplo de, del icono terráqueo. Es un mundo que va a aparecer en la parte de abajo a mano derecha en su pantalla. No lo van a ver aún, pero después de las instrucciones va a aparecer y en ese entonces asegúrense de seleccionarlo y escoger el español como su, su idioma preferido. Y si es necesario, usted lo prefiere, puede poner el audio original en silencio. Eh, voy a repetir todo esto en inglés. De ahí prendemos la interpretación y les regreso su tiempo para comenzar. Gracias por su paciencia. All right, folks. Thank you for your patience as I provided those uh, instructions in Spanish first. Um, but once again, my name is Alejandro. Thank you for having me. And in this space, we do want to practice language justice as much as possible. Language justice indicates to us that every person should be able to participate in the language of their heart. And a couple of tools to make that happen in this space are going to be, for example, I want to uh, also highlight that we have Ray Martinez, who is an ASL interpreter with us today. So we want to honor that we have that, that language in this space. Um, we also have Spanish. And if you're not fluent in all of the languages present, then this uh, you will also select your language. Language justice really, it takes all of us to make it happen. So if your preferred language is English, then after these instructions, not quite yet, but afterwards, you're going to see a globe icon appear on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Once that pops up, make sure you go ahead and click on it and select English. And you can also hit mute original audio if you find it necessary or prefer to do so. And you can see an example of that here on your screen. Um, so once we hand it back over to our host, we'll turn on that interpretation and you'll see all three languages running, uh, English, Spanish, and ASL. So once again, thank you to our hosts and everybody here for making language justice happen today. Um, Iran, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you to turn on, to, to turn on the interpretation. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, uh, Alejandro, and uh, Emma as well. Uh, so um, I am, uh, again, so excited to um, be able to introduce the, this panel and also the panelists today. We are going to be discussing um, assemblies, um, and um, we, we are joined by, you know, four amazing panelists. Um, we have Denzel Caldwell from the Black Nashville Assembly. We have Edgar Franks um, from Familias Unidas por la Justicia. Uh, we have Marissa Holmes, who is an organizer with Occupy Wall Street. And also we have Michael Hart, who is a professor of literature at Duke University um, and the co-author of Assembly with uh, Antonio Negri. So we're gonna do, um, we're going to start off with each panelist doing um, a brief presentation. Um, they've been given questions to kind of reflect upon and they will be sharing their remarks. Uh, then we will have um, 20 minutes of responses where they we will do a round and each person will be able to sort of share any thoughts in response to each other that they might have had that might have been prompted by um, the presentations. And then we're gonna open it up to questions and answers from the audience. Um, there is also the ability to ask questions um, through the um, Zoom webinar. So feel free at any point, um, if you do have questions, you can ask uh, there as well. 
Uh, and I want to also shout out Abel and Mason. Thank you so much for helping to bottom line the tech stuff for the for the webinar today. Um, so these are our wonderful panelists. So I think just to say really quickly, you know, um, we're we're gathered here today to look at the issue of assembly, specifically um, in the context of radical municipalism and how we can build constituent power. Um, so, you know, radical municipalism for us, there are many different forms and flavors for, munis uh, for municipalism. And the one that we are directly inspired by is radical municipalism. So it's the vision that our social movements can destroy the coercive and hegemonic structures that currently rule over us and then replace them with decentralized um, and counter hegemonic structures, uh, alternatives um, uh, that are based on principles of direct democracy, solidarity economy, feminized, or I would say queer, gender queer politics, you know, non-binary politics. <laughs> um, and then, you know, that, that prioritize collaboration, dialogue and horizontality. Um, and so, you know, there is a tradition of people's movement assemblies, um, you know, both globally as well as here in North America. Um, people, people's movement assemblies are gatherings of people to make decisions for collective action and for power. We have been gathering as assemblies of people during times of crisis, when the market or when the state fails us. Um, and then also just in terms of times of movement cycles, when there's a great sort of energy and surge in the movement, we come together to self-organize ourselves and often prefigure the new societies that we want to be building. Um, and so I think, you know, assemblies also, you know, to some extent could be part of a dual power strategy. It could be a way of thinking about not just resisting the current status quo that we currently live in, but also how do we build something different? How do we build, you know, as the Wobblies like to say, how do we build a new world in the shell of the old and then gradually transition from that old world into the new? Um, so can assemblies embody that type of constituent power? Uh, so again, I'm so excited to have this incredible group of panelists uh, who work with assemblies um, in their different facets come and address this question for us. So we are going to start off with Michael, who will talk about the theory of the multitude and the assembly, um, followed by Marissa, who will talk about her experiences with Occupy Wall Street. Um, and then currently with the Metro Anarchist Coordinating Committee in New York City. Uh, and then Edgar, who will talk about how popular uh, people's movement assemblies are used in farm worker organizing um, in Bellingham, Washington. And also, I think it's a, it's a model that's spreading across uh, different, different locations. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, we will have Denzel talk about how assemblies are helping to build Black political power uh, in Nashville. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Michael to get us started. Great. Thanks very much, Yvonne, and, and, and thanks to the Municipalism Learning Series for, for organizing this. I, um, I want to start with some general like rather large, what do you call it? High level ideas about assembly. I, I see assemblies in general as uh, structures or institutions for democratic decision-making. And already the notion dem for democratic decision-making is um, insisting on a on really a critique of the notion of democracy that we've been brought up with and fed. So that, the, that I think inventing a new form of democracy is really uh, present and one of the one of the tasks of the different forms of assembly. Obviously, um, assemblies are run differently, uh, constructed differently in different places. But I do want to think about, or at least pose at the beginning, you know, before we actually are able to discuss concretely with each other, some of what I see as the primary difficulties, but also the importance of assemblies. Like I said, as democratic decision making structures. I mean, first, the, some of the difficulties. Any of you who have participated in the, in in 
in various forms of assemblies recognize the difficulties of the time required, uh, especially when consensus is required in in, in uh, assemblies. But more important for me are the difficulties regarding how we create equality within a assembly structure. I mean, one can't uh, assume, and maybe this is obvious, that simply because everyone um, participates, or even if everyone were to vote or something like that, that we can that we assume that we're all equal. Instead, what assemblies have to do, and I think in in the assemblies that I've that I know and have participated in recent decades, all try different ways of um, compensating for the hierarchies and inequalities that um, that people come with to the assemblies. Uh, you know, sometimes th these techniques to counter existing inequalities, um, sometimes posing um, ordering for who can speak first, uh, trying to counter the kinds of inequalities even of those who have more experience, those who have more experience in public uh, speaking, uh, et cetera. And that this is already a, I mean, it's really a technical question, but it has, it seems to me it has uh, great uh, political importance for how to structure assemblies to create the possibility for equality and not assume equality from the beginning. I think I'm saying something that everybody already recognizes, but it's, um, but it does seem to me an important aspect. You know, I mean, it's an important difficulty that assemblies, I think, have ways of overcoming. Uh, I also wanted to mention, in addition to that, just as a starting point, that what I see is some aspects of the importance of assemblies. Um, Yvonne mentioned that that if uh, assemblies in some in some cases are thought to, and or maybe in most cases are thought to prefigure um, the society we want. You know, in some ways, enacting in 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 miniature. You know, in our own uh, organizing um, structures, the kind of society we could create. And I think that's that's definitely true. Maybe I want to think a little bit more concretely about that prefiguring. I mean, well, it's not just the prefiguring, and maybe I'm maybe I'm also thinking about a slightly different point, which is that I think one of the importance of assemblies is their ability or task to be able to articulate among diverse movements or diverse um, groups within the assembly. We've seen in many of the assemblies of 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 recent decades, or at least I can think of a number of them, which have which have um, aspired to provide modes for articulation of different movements. I mean, for instance, and, and I'm sure Marissa can talk about the aspirations within Occupy Wall Street and the other Occupies to be able to have anti-capitalist movements and anti-racist movements and feminist movements uh, participate together and the difficulties of doing that. But I think it's the job of the assembly or it's the assembly form that can possibly allow for uh, and construct the terms in which there can what the we can have an articulation among uh, different components, different different movements within the assembly itself. Um, so what we have what actually has to be accomplished, yeah, so not just on the individual scale, that's sort of the way I was presenting it earlier as a difficulty. Here it's really at a, at a collective scale that the assembly must accomplish a, a strategic decision really, that there is no priority among the different movements that compose it, you know, so that the articulation among, sometimes they figure the way I, I mentioned earlier, you know, like uh, among uh, queer and, and feminist components or trans components or 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 anti-capitalist components that they um, are able to articulate together in the in the assembly structure structure without priority among them. That's something I think that's actually a um, an important capacity, potential capacity of assemblies, but also one that must be invented, invented each time in each uh, assembly structure. So let me stop there. I think I'm I'm probably up to, up up with uh, the initial time. I just want to emphasize some, yeah, both. Uh, yeah, what would you say the challenges and the uh, potentials 
that I see within within different assembly structures. That's where I wanted to start. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we have uh, Marissa. Uh, we have you up next. Sure. Well, it's kind of a natural segue <laughs> into the, the experiment that was Occupy Wall Street. And, you know, I say was because we're talking 12 years ago now. Um, but, you know, a lot of the experiences that people had informed ongoing work and relationships. Um, so there is an afterlife to occupy um, as there is for, for all of these experiments. Um, and one of the afterlives is MAC, the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, which I'm currently part of. I've been organizing with them for six, seven years now. <laughs> so it's been quite a, quite a while, a ride. Um, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of background first on the, the possibilities and pitfalls of the Occupy experiment. Um, so for those who, I guess, who don't know, Occupy was organized. <laughs> it wasn't just a spontaneous uprising of people, although there was a lot of spontaneity. Um, there were people who helped facilitate it and you know give birth to it, uh, so to speak. And um, I was one of those people, but there were dozens of us who participated in the early New York City General Assembly, NYCGA, um, and we met every Saturday at Tompkins Square Park in the Lower East Side. And the Lower East Side has a particular history in, in New York um, that's really you know, connected to anarchist and autonomous movements over the years, um, definitely a site of a lot of squatting <laughs> um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, some of those you know, became legalized later, but there's um, there's a legacy of that and of, of community gardens. And so it wasn't random, you know, choosing this particular spot of Tonkin Square Park. Um, and we met through there throughout the summer, every Saturday. And, um, you know, the assembly was comprised of, of individuals. And I guess this is a key point that the assembly form, at least initially, um, is really an aggregate of, of individuals who come to participate rather than um, groups that are already formed in, in coalition. Um, and out of the assembly, there's this kind of emergence that happens, right? And people identify different needs and tasks and things that they want to focus on. Um, so we had working groups um, on tactical, food, um, media, outreach, um, the internet committee. Later, we had a legal group and a medical group. Um, and this kind of way of doing things was directly influenced by the global justice movement. So, um, you know, I think it's important that we're, we're meeting today on N30 um, and reflecting also on this history. Um, it was very much present in the experiment of Occupy through, you know, people like David, but also Marina Citrin and Lisa Fithian and, you know, countless others who gave their time and, um, and were very patient with us. Um, as you know, as new people on the scene, young people coming up, um, and so we learned how to facilitate and plan direct actions, and you know build these kinds of structures, um, and we you know we integrated those lessons in in real time. Um, so that was what was happening over the summer as we were responding to this call from Adbusters, um, and then we drafted this statement on September third, which I'm going to read for all of you. Um, New York City General Assemblies are an open, participatory, horizontally organized process through which we are building the capacity to constitute ourselves in public as autonomous collective forces within and against representative politics, cultural death, and the constant crisis of our times. <laughs> um, so we had these, these very grand visions, right, of uh, transforming the world and ourselves and uh, engaging in this um, this democratic process with each other. And, you know, this, uh, it was kind of, um, I don't know, uh, electric or <laughs> I, you couldn't get away from it, you know, like people kept coming back because they, they had a, a say in, in the decisions that affected them. And that, you know, that was really 
immediately empowering and obvious to, to everyone there. And we just you know, became great friends and, you know, sometimes lovers. And, you know, this is um, what happens in these kinds of moments, right? And um, yeah, so all of that was, was before the occupation itself. And then the occupation obviously, you know, opened up this, this space. Um, and I guess I want to clarify what, what an occupation even is, because, you know, occupy versus decolonize this language, you know, is debated. Um, and also, you know, even people who use the term occupy use it in different ways. Um, what it meant to, to us um, was a total reconfiguration of the space so that rather than a public space, um, it was a social space and one that was um, productive, you know, reproductive and productive um, and uh, essentially a commons. So um, there was a commons reading group over the summer that was, you know, an <laughs> influence on us, among other things. Um, but we really saw it as a different kind of relationship altogether, this, you know, space time of, of occupation. Um, it wasn't a sit in, it wasn't a protest, it was um, a way of, of resisting and building this, you know, new world in the shell of the old, um, or the city within a city. And um, yeah, and we were, you know, one of many in the US and internationally, obviously, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the international context later. Um, but yeah, that's what we meant by occupation. Um, and this question of, of who the constituents were, I think, is, is a really important one and one that Michael started to touch on, um, because it does get to like the inevitable conflicts <laughs> that, that emerge. Um, so, you know, who are the 99%? What do we mean when we say 99%? Um, you know, this, this was debated within the assembly early on and throughout. And, um, you know, it was really the, the, even the catchphrase of the 99% was, was something that was created through the process. Um, it wasn't one individual, it wasn't even David, you know, it was <laughs> everyone who was, you know, contributing to these conversations. And, you know, we really trusted in this collective intelligence that um, was made possible through the assembly convergence. Um, but the 99% you know, is the people who, who don't have wealth or access to political power, right, against the 1% who, who do. Um, and within the 99%, there were multiple identities. You know, this is kind of um, building off of some of, of Michael's work. Um, also, although we didn't we didn't explicitly call ourselves a multitude <laughs> or a multiplicity, but but there was this multiple you know sense of things and you know um, identities within the space. So the 99% you know could be uh, black, brown, indigenous. It could be queer. It could be you know women. It could be um, any number of of people. But um, but obviously those those differences have to be uh, negotiated within the space <laughs> of the assembly. And eventually we had caucuses, we had the, the People of Color Caucus, um, and then we had um, the Women's Caucus and the Safer Spaces Committee, and we had uh, a Queer Caucus, uh, queering, queering OWS, we had a Disability Caucus. Um, and some of those caucuses ended up having sort of spin-off assemblies of their own. Um, there was a feminist GA for a while, um, but they were, they were part of the movement. You know, so we were all in solidarity, working together, explicitly referencing each other, building with each other. Um, and it, you know, the move. I think it's important to rem remember that it was a multiracial, multiethnic, multigender movement, um, and that wasn't just you know rhetoric. It wasn't just like this illusion of unity of the ninety nine percent. It really did happen, and unfortunately, um, you know, various actors, state actors non-state actors uh, were able to to break us apart and you know break down that trust so you know it's so important like in order to work across these differences and understand you know how how people are living and feeling things like there has to be this this sense of trust and of course you know in the existing society the dominant society that we're in um we don't have that trust so it has to be consciously built um over and over again and you know toxic ways of operating have to be unlearned and um and all that was happening in this very raw sometimes painful way you know and we weren't able to resolve everything while being under under attack um 
so yeah, there are a lot of lessons learned there, but um, where am I on time? Oh, I'm at time. <laughs> I, I could talk for, for a long time about all of this, but uh, yes, I don't know, scale. Yes, we were able to scale. Scale was not so much of a problem. Um, there are a lot of things that we can get to, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks, yeah. Marissa. Um, I'm so uh, glad to uh, next uh, introduce um, uh, Edgar to uh, to to present from uh, from Bellingham or from Bellingham, Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> well, I'm in uh, now. I'm in uh, Burlington, Washington, which is like. Uh, a smaller town, it's just south of Bellingham, but it's you know it's in the same area. Um, the I grew up. This is actually where I grew up in this area. Um, I'm Edgar. I'm with Familias Unidas por la Justicia. It's an independent farm worker union based here in Burlington, Washington. Um, um, it's really close to the Canadian border, um, <clears throat> um, on the west coast. Um, I serve as the political director for for the union. Um, sorry for being late. Uh, we were doing some union business right now and just got in and glad to be here. And thank you for your patience and all the work speakers that are on and for the invite. But I think that, uh, yeah, this, this topic, this issue about assemblies, um, you know, it's something that at the union has been very foundational um, from the get-go. Uh, uh, even before Familias Unidas was an actual union, the actual like cultural practice of assemblies that go, you know, um, our membership is uh, Mexican indigenous people from Guerrero and Oaxaca, uh, Mixteco and Triqui people that have had this practice like democratic practice and participatory uh, method of collective decision making um you know and this is something that has been a constant uh, no matter where the the people have migrated from whether it be up and down the west coast in mexico and california oregon and here in washington so you know this this meeting these kinds of practices of people collectively getting together, um, whether they call it assemblies or not, has been something that has been, you know, very ingrained within the farm worker community here. Um, you know, and, you know, I think it's important to have that kind of history um, uh, centered, especially when we are talking about uh, when we were trying to form uh, uh, a union, which is, you know, it is more like a, you know, it's a, more of a, it was a very unfamiliar place for a lot of our farm workers. And, you know, the the bureaucratic practices of a union is way different than the popular demo democratic uh, ways that we gather um, uh, on a normal basis. So, you know, in the union, we had to set up formally uh, presidents, vice presidents, secretary, treasurer, which in, in assemblies, you don't have any of that. You just have people that maybe facilitate and kind of pose questions and then the discussion happens. So, you know, I think thinking back now um, in how the union was, was first uh, um, thought of as like a, a vehicle to achieve uh, a specific goal of reaching a collective bargaining agreement, um, the that uh, practice of assembly, of getting together, um, uh, of collective decision making and building power and analysis, um, was very you know that was one of the things that really uh, pushed the union forward um, and kept it together. Um, you know, uh, because at the same time, like all these democratic practices and processes are denied when uh, you're here in the U.S. and you're a, a farm worker or an immigrant or a poor person. Um, 
Um, so assemblies are one of the only ways that you actually can maybe uh, voice your concerns and opinions and your solutions to to problems. Um, um, so, you know, I think that, you know, even that in itself of like the assembly of the workers when they went out on strike, um, you know, saying, well, we can keep going on strike or we can go and find this, you know, one goal of like where we don't have to go on strike every day is go and get a union contract, um, which uh, again, going for a union contract was a collective decision using a participatory democratic uh, method, which was the assemblies, um, you know, and some, and, you know, knowing full well that we were going to go into a, a structure that is not made to, that's not friendly for farm workers. Um, you know, we, you know, we're, we don't know the national labor relations board and the, F the fair labor standards that like all these things are things that we just are running into, which are very hard, especially when, you know, you're trying to get to the root of the issues um, and, you know, the structure as it's built, it's really hard to create any, any kind of change. So this is, I think the function for us of the assembly of trying to navigate those two different worlds one that we really know how to participate in and one that's very technical and bureaucratic and exclusionary. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, that uh, because of the history of uh, farm workers being denied any access into labor and any labor rights, um, historically, the race, racist laws and practices um, that, you know, that very intentionally, um, that this is an important method of building an alternative kind of power um, that gives people hope um, and a space to really breathe and not have to um, uh, be dictated maybe for the first time by your boss. Like you, you actually have like a way to to communicate with other workers, um, what you're feeling and what everybody else is feeling. So, the I think for like back to the question of like the promise of the assembly and the peril, the promise is that it gives people a space for hope, and to imagine and to really envision what we want. You know, it, it is. I mean, we do talk about like how hard life is, of course. But it all, you know, once we get down to the to the um, actual thing, it also gives us time to settle down and really think and come up with the things that we really want. As outrageous that many people like on the outside might think, um, as it might sound like, you know, oh, you're uh, like for us in our case, it was like, well, you're undocumented workers, you're immigrants, you don't speak English, not much Spanish. Uh, you have no no uh, no way you're gonna beat this corporation um, to to get a contract. It's impossible. It's almost an impossible. But if the assemblies like and the those practices weren't there um, in the first place from the get go to give us that chance to imagine and really plan and strategize, um, it would have made things way more difficult. Um, so, you know, that's been the promise, I think, for us um, at the union um, and the building of, of the independent union, um, not trying to fall into like just becoming an administrative uh, bureaucratic union, but also having in mind that there's a much larger movement outside of, of our union and, um, you know, being respectful of, of like of the other social movements that are happening. Um, that we where we can fit in and build build solidarity uh, with those other with those other movements. You know, we're in a rural area, um, but you know because the practice of the assembly it 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 uh, gives us like a a familiarity when other people are also in struggle and um, asking for for support. 
that it gives us a way to also bring in those voices of from the outside that we are not familiar with, but are still invited to to share our experiences and we hear their experiences and then seeing how we can um, um, support one another. And I think that's been one of the big values of the of of having, you know, these assemblies. Um, the perils, I think, is the scale. Um, you know, we always want to amplify and build power to the max. And, and I think that's been one of the big challenges of like trying to figure out um, the scale and how how to do it in a respectful way of other people's processes. Um, um, but I see my time is up and I know there's going to be more questions. So I'll uh, I'll stop there for now. So thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, so we now have uh, Denzel from the Black Nashville Assembly. All right. Uh, hey, everybody, peace. Um, and again, thank you for the municipalism mm -hmm. cohort for inviting me here. Um, so uh, my name is Denzel um, Caldwell, pronouns he, him, his, um, and I'm an organizer with the Black Nashville Assembly. Um, which is what we call a participatory democracy project um, or a power base building project uh, in a political home, as we like to say, for people who can vote, can't vote, or have nothing to vote for. Um, and so to kind of give you a little context for um, how we got here, I think it's important to uplift the uh, Black liberation struggle that has taken place in the South. And so, of course, like when we think about the South, we have to think about the um, plantation economy that has existed uh, in the South uh, due to chattel slavery and the enslavement of African peoples. And so um, Black liberation uh, struggles uh, certainly began long before we were forcibly uh, brought here, but definitely uh, a lot of the epicenter of that has been, um, at least here uh, in this part of the world, in the South, right? Um, ground zero being the uh, places of uh, former plant plantations, right? And so uh, when we're thinking about the South where we have a densely, uh, one of the most densely populated areas of black people um, where uh, we have um, the region of the, the country that's least friendly to, to unions, um, where we see much of the infrastructure um, associated with mm -hmm. uh, prisons um, and where we also see uh, uh, military infrastructure, uh, much of which is in the U.S. So um, this is the conditions that, that we're organizing in. Um, when we talk about the work that we do at the Black National Assembly, we like to think of our, ourselves or our political lineage tracing back to people uh, such as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC, um, or particularly thinking back to their organizing work through uh, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization um, with Kwame Ture and others, um, where you had Black people who were in the midst of Jim Crow uh, era, the Jim Crow apartheid, um, as another way of putting it, um, where they were disempowered. Uh, they were disempowered um, both by the legacy of chattel slavery and the implementation of this apartheid state, um, and also um, disempowered in ways to where they could not self-determine how resources were allocated, um, who got to sit in power, even in a local office, um, to dictate their every day, everyday lives. And so the assembly structure within this context of the Black Liberation Movement was a tool used to organize and bring Black people into uh, the same space uh, in a way that was explicitly politicized, right? Um, and so we would often find ourselves gathering um, in our spiritual uh, homes, in our homes, um, or in times where we had to decompress from the day-to-day -day struggles of uh, living in this white supremacist empire. and. So the assembly space was a space where we could explicitly um, exercise our muscles of self-determination and thinking through our, condi our political conditions uh, where we lack power, where we can build political power and um, thinking through the bridge of how to get from where we currently are to where we want to be as far as 
being able to uh, self-determine our, our collective futures. And so um, in that same vein that SNCC was uh, in the Lounge Freedom uh, Organization, county organization was able to, to organize, uh, we, we come from that vein. Um, we're definitely a believer um, or, and practitioner of participatory democracy where um, we understand that in order to build a community um, or to co-create a community that is um, uh, able to self-determine and, and imagine um, and, and develop a community beyond um, the sort of this current capitalist, white supremacist, patriarchal reality um, that we need to foster um, leadership development and a sort of protagonism, right? And so part of that looks like um, entering our spaces where we um, talk to people about their experiences as they are in the language that they understand it. Um, and then you, uh, using that mm -hmm. space or sort of those exchange of stories to build a larger analysis together about what uh, are our uh, current conditions. Um, and then from there, we're able to uh, get a little bit more granular in terms of the uh, forces, both internal and external, that are able to um, uh, sh that are shaping our realities. Um, and then ultimately, we're able to think through what are some ways that we can act together collectively um, to transform our conditions and to shift power in such a way to where we're able to determine determine our material futures. And so um, part of the work that we've been doing since we uh, began back in 2020 was developing, um, at least in the electoral arena, um, a grassroots political agenda. Right. And so we have like assembly assembly members that have participated um, in our assemblies for over uh, three years who were able to um, compile and vote on and finalize a um, political agenda or set of uh, politicized uh, demands for last year's uh, mayoral and city council elections. And so what that did was that uh, created a new sort of political environment in Nashville where uh, instead of uh, often corporate backed uh, uh, politicians who would run for office would uh, give their electoral pitch and uh, say what they would do for people without engaging people's actual curiosities. Um, the, what we saw instead was a collectivized agenda that people were able to um, bring to a sp uh, space that they created, um, sort of Q uh, Q&A spaces, um, and they were able to shape questions um, and, and, and feedback um, for those folks running for office in a way to where we were able to uh, get past some of their uh, stump speeches and uh, some of the performance, political theater, and get to um, what's real, right? Uh, we were able to see through some of the contradictions that came up with um, certain people running for office, where their interests were, um, and how they clash with uh, the, the interests of uh, a lot of working class Black people in Nashville. And so as a result of that, uh, that has played a significant role in how we are able to uh, normalize uh, conversations around participatory democracy. And we're able to have sharper conversations around um, people who sit in seats of power and may uh, present themselves as someone who represents the interest of working class Black people in, in particular in Nashville, but uh, their record, their, uh, their interests, the people who they align themselves mm -hmm. with say otherwise. And so part of what our goal uh, in our uh, assembly work uh, through the Black National Assembly is to continue to build that that muscle of, of, of co-governance. So beyond just a policy demand, thinking through things that uh, the community might need that we can resolve in the in the short term and uh, in between elect electoral cycles, but also thinking through ways in which we can um, strategically um, take power, uh, whether it be uh, particular public offices or pushing certain uh, uh, local um, uh, citywide demands that uh, will be passed through 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 law. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for some of the conversation that we're gonna have. Thank you, Denzel. Uh, I'm gonna bring all of the panelists back into the spotlight. 
um, so that we can move to the uh, next portion, which is um, doing a um, doing. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know how to. Okay, so doing um, doing a, a response, uh, doing a round of responses with each other. Um, so I think that um, I think that um, you know you know, just to say that, you know, so I didn't, so I forgot to acknowledge that today is November 30th. So it is the, um, it is the, uh, you know, the, the 24th anniversary of the Battle of Seattle, when the World Trade Organization was shut down in the first salvo of the anti-globalization movement, at least in, you know, my generation, at least, which, you know, uh, kind of sparked, you know, a lot of uh, political radicalizations of um, folks, you know, in my generation. Um, and, you know, I think that we are currently, as, as I said earlier, we are currently experiencing other types of movement moments right now. So, um, you know, we are seeing a big um, upsurge in Palestinian solidarity work um, in response to the genocide and murder and massacre of Palestinians in Gaza and in other settlements uh, and occupied lands. Um, and we're also seeing that assemblies play a role in that, at least I think in cities here throughout North America, a lot of the organizing is happening, you know, uh, as people come together in the form of an assembly. Um, and then we also see that assemblies play a role in terms of creating kind of that dual power alternative governance structure or co-governance structure in um, among the Zapatistas who announced a recent sort of restructuring of their governance and then also uh, in Rojava as well. Uh, so just, just to provide, you know, I just wanted to sort of mention that and add that in. Um, th those were part of some of the framing questions that um, folks were asked to, to sort of consider and to think about um, uh, in terms of um, thinking about, you know, the, the remarks. But I will now uh, cede the space to the um, panelists to, you know, either respond to those questions, um, uh, respond to each other, um, and, you know, sort of have a dialogue. Um, so we're going to start first with, um, in the order of how people sort of presented. So we're going to start first with Michael, then we're going to go to... Um, we're gonna to go to uh, Marissa and then Edgar and then Denzel. I know that there's been questions for both Edgar and Denzel in the Q&A. Maybe we also do have Q&A from the audience after this. So maybe that could be a time when you address those questions. I see that we're, I don't know if everyone sees everyone right now in the video space. <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that. <laughs> okay, maybe maybe that's not a problem. Okay, all right, so, so uh, Michael, take us away. Well, I just wanted to point out two things that I found really interesting in and in somewhat resonance with each other in Edgar and, and Denzel's um, descriptions and presentations. And it's about a uh, tension among different democratic forms, I guess. You know, so with 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 Denzel, I'm I'm interested in and I don't know if you if there's if it's really a question or really just saying what a, one thing that interests me about the the relationship between the participatory democracy of the assemblies and the grassroots electoral project. I mean, obviously, I mean, the grassroots electoral project is driven by the assemblies, but nonetheless, the participation within the electoral sphere and some aspects of that could create certain kinds of tensions. Since I was, if that, if there is, I would love to hear more about how, if there's a need to manage tensions between those two spheres, I, I'm not sure if I need to explain it more, but it seems like you're understanding sort of what I mean. And and so similarly, Edgar, it's even a little bit more complicated, I find, you know, you have three levels you presented for us. There's one in which farm workers are denied participation in, in, in the standard or democratic practices in many ways and traditionally. There's also then the, uh, I guess the 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 assemblies in some ways compensate for that. I mean, I, the way I see it is that it allows people a, a political participation in a different kind of democratic structure in the assemblies. But then the 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 union 
participation makes it still more complicated, I guess. And you mentioned something about the tensions between, I mean, I, I, it's certainly true. And it, as you said, the, the unions provide a access to workplace power that's, you know, that seems super important. But nonetheless, you were saying, as I was understanding it, that there's that there's a certain kind of tensions between the assembly structure and its decision making processes and the necessarily bureaucratic union structures that in order to participate in that world. So I guess I would I, I would like to you you said already that there's a management of those tensions. I would I would love to hear more about if you feel like there's more to say about how to um, negotiate that relationship between the democratic and participatory assemblies and the union structure which um which has let's say it's put some limits on the democratic you know participation in it you see, you see what i mean right edgar anyway so uh, that i just wanted to yeah I, those are my two um yeah i'm not sure if they even qualify as questions they could just be it's like that was interesting and and uh and leave it at that Okay, I guess I guess I'm going next. <laughs> We're doing a round. Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to respond to to Edgar um, and on this question of um, you know workers who are left out of existing structures and definitely labor law um, and protections. And you know this is this is something that we tried to. Work around and occupy, um, especially with the the May Day general strike organizing um, in 2012, and you know the even the call itself um, was around connecting different kinds of labor, so domestic labor, immigrant labor, prison labor, um, and so you know expanding even you know, like what you know, the sort of established labor movement was willing to consider, and then um, also challenging the the you know more established unions in the labor council in, in New York, um, like SEIU and CWA and AFSCME, and um, we were pretty successful in doing that. I think like holding space for you know for worker assemblies and people to connect and um, and build rank and file organization. And some of that continued on. You know you can see reverberations and like fight for 15 type organizing or um, with brand workers, which is a, a worker center um, that operates with assemblies um, and, you know, organizing immigrant workers in the, in the food industry in New York. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, there's, there's that, <laughs> that sort of continuity, I guess I just wanted to, to bring up. Um, and yeah, with Denzel, um, you know, certainly uh, there was a lot of discussion in, in Occupy about SNCC and this legacy of participatory democracy and what it meant and um, referencing Ella Baker. And so it um, it was present for sure, especially in the in the POC caucus and some of the work that they were doing. Um, but I guess I, I wanted to say, too, that um, there's this kind of missed uh, connection you know, often when people talk about Occupy and Black Lives Matter, they talk about them as like totally separate um, movements with you know, like their own influences and origins. And, you know, there there are differences, but in New York, um, a lot of the people were were the same. <laughs> there is this, you know, this overlap that happened in, in 2012, 2013 into 2014 in the sort of early stage of, of Black Lives Matter. And, you know, people organizing around uh, where Marley Graham in the Bronx and Kamani Gray in Brooklyn, um, and cop watch crews coming together. Um, some of some of them who you know met in Occupy, um, like the cop watch CPU crew in the Bronx that was bottom lining um, NYC shut it down and doing like weekly actions for collective liberation. And I mean they, um, yeah, they all. I mean they didn't know each other before they met you know through Occupy networks and then decided to use assemblies and use working groups and use these kinds of you know ways of operating but you know in in the Bronx um, with their friends and family and I yeah I, just a lot of that gets lost <laughs> somehow um, in the the way that the story the dominant story is told um, but 
yeah, there were there were definitely ways that um that were continued either in in workplaces or um, at at like a neighborhood level against policing. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Um. Yeah, I'll uh, try to answer some of the questions from uh, that were asked right now. But I also wanted to some of the thoughts from just listening to the to the folks on the panel. I think, uh, well, for farm worker history within the U the U.S., yeah, it is. It was agriculture, industrial agriculture was. You know, we have to acknowledge it. It it was founded on on uh, on racism on exploiting and violence, like especially towards African people um, that were brought here into the into the United States for um, for to keep the, you know, that that time the American economy going or whatever. Um, so we do have to recognize that and we're still very much on the same system um, that has, you know, existed since the foundation of um, of this country and its agricultural um, economy, um, you know, and I think with a lot of the gains that have been made by unions throughout the years, um, intentionally farm workers and domestic workers have been left out of any kind of protection because of the exclusion of Black folks from from those those deals, you know, the compromises that were made by mostly white unions in the 30s. To this day, a lot of those laws are still in place. Um, so, you know, we have to acknowledge that that's like the history that we're coming from still. Um, um, I think uh, also to recognize that the union um, from here was not, it, it, it wasn't just in a vacuum. It just didn't happen in a vacuum. There was these, a lot of these things were happening. I think at that time, the Occupy Wall Street was happening uh, when some of the workers were starting to kind of organize, you know, um, or just kind of in general, it was out in the in the world. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, which brought attention to wealth inequality, um, especially for low wage workers, which here in in the Northwest, you know, it took in the the shape of the Fifty Now campaign, um, which inspired the workers to when they we started first talking about like well what do we want at that time minimum wage was like seven dollars i forget what it was in washington but in 2013 um but the workers because of all these things that were out in the world they're like oh well we want 15 dollars an hour also which at that time was unheard of for farm workers so you know how all these actions and things that were happening uh, around outside of us but still we're influencing uh, what we want. So I think that's, that was like another thing that the union is very much a product from like of the moment that we were living in that political moment. You know, Trayvon Martin stuff was still happening at that time. Um, and then Black Lives Matter and all that. So, you know, all that was, you know, we saw the protests, direct actions and the workers were like, well, we want to do direct actions too. You know, um, so, you know, I, it, it all it, it was feeding into one thing was feeding into another. So it was kind of interesting to see that like on the ground in real time. Um, uh, yeah. And to some of the questions that Michael um, had posed, there is a lot of those tensions that do come up um, because, you know, in assembly, everybody participates in the union. It's only the collective bargaining unit that collect that can participate. So you exclude, maybe we're all in the same community, but you do exclude a big portion of the people that are working outside of a collective bargaining. And that causes tension. They're like, well, you know, uh, you're only helping those people. Why aren't you, we're all here, you know, we're all farm workers. Why are you only helping them? So we try our best to do like all work for all the farm workers, but, you know, um, it does cause those kinds of, of, of tensions because we're used to, you know, everybody helping everyone, but then like you come into the union structure and you're like, oh, we have to like provide special services or there's things that we have to do for our members that we can't do for for the community in general. So it does create those kinds of things. And those are um, issues that are 
always present and it really you know we're trying our best to kind of accommodate everyone um with the the folks that we have in the capacity so um yeah it is very it is a very different structure um um now in a formal union um that bureaucratic process and trying to make sure everyone is taken care of so you know still participating in a in the best way and systems outside of the of the union to make sure everybody gets um, the benefits of a collective bargaining agreement but also even if they're not in a collective bargaining agreement they still can benefit and participate in somehow yeah um yeah so i'll i guess i'll respond to uh some of the uh, curiosities or responses that Marissa and Michael had raised. So I, I guess to the to the first question about uh, wrestling with uh, the tensions of participatory democracy within the assembly and the actual electoral process, part of what some of those of us who were the uh, sort of original organizers for the assembly had thought through was that um, we understand this this sort of electoral trap or neoliberal trap in particular that we uh find our people in where you know they're encouraged they they're they're able to see a problem and they're uh, led to believe that all oh, simply by electing a singular person who's not accountable to um any sort of like collective structure or anything leads to some miraculous shift um and i think part of the challenge um, that we have um, in in using the sim uh, the assembly in relation to electoral uh, cycles is how do we interject into the electoral space to uh, to show or raise contradictions of like the electoral process, like the limitations, um, and even some of the ways that uh, participatory democracy is discouraged in that space. Um, how are we able to like sort of like politically educate people in a sort of a real time way where we're participating and showing the pitfalls while at the same time building people's sort of um, protagonist uh, protagonism and sort of like self determined uh, muscles to then think okay let's start thinking more creatively around how we can govern ourselves and begin to think about ways to wield power such that we can change our conditions like through our collective action rather than trying to participate in a uh, sort of a state process, right? Um, and so that it, it, it's it's tough work because a lot of people are oriented towards caring about uh, going out and going to the ballot and then thinking that's the extent of political um, activity or, or wielding political power. And so part of that is us really grounding ourselves in um, uh, Huey P. Newton's definition of power, really, um, ability to name phenomena and then also to uh, make uh, those things happen and just being really insistent and really like, uh, ask, uh, like asking assembly members to think through who is shaping how we understand uh, reality and who and like on whose behalf are we working for, even when we go to the ballot or when we decide that we want to, you know, uh, uh, push for a particular policy. Um, or even uh, try to support a, uh, a candidate, right? Like who who exactly is shaping that decision? Is it something that we've been conditioned to believe because we're used to this electoral process? Or is this something that has come from sort of a collective decision um, that we have, uh, we felt would, was necessary in order to uh, shape, our, shape our environment? Um, I think to uh, Marissa, your your point about like this narrative of like sort of treating uh, Black Lives Matter movement and Occupy Wall, uh, Wall Street as sort of these mutually exclusive uh, movements is is a really key point, um, and I think is you know explicitly a tool of empire, because oftentimes there's this thing that happens um, where uh, you know we treat overlapping issues um as just that it, it mutually exclusive as though 
you know, forms of uh, anti-Blackness um, aren't directly tied to or, or materialized in, in uh, through capitalism, right? Um, or we pretend as though, you know, uh, patriarchy doesn't, isn't directly informed or enforced through um, sort of capitalist um, value statements or things that we place on people's bodies or things of that sort. And so I think one, one of the reasons why um, our assembly work, uh, we, uh, one of our tenets is, is solidarity economy and, and challenging capitalism is also with this understanding that like that, that this sort of nonprofit sort of like sectioning off of uh, particular front lines is the thing that is actually sort of discouraging and deflating a potential revolutionary energy um, and organization. Um, and so part of the way we push back on that is thinking through um, and challenging the um, the whole definition or idea of Black issues, right? So we're not reducing it to like this question of representation um, in sort of the neoliberal sense, but thinking about it materially. And as a result, that causes us to think more expansively around who exactly um, is impacted by the housing crisis we experience or the state violence that we experience, or even um, just the lack of... Um, control of, of, of public education here. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna invite uh, Abel and Mason to help, uh, to help facilitate the next section where we're gonna take um, questions from the, from the attendees. Great. Um, so we have two uh, questions directed at um, individuals, Denzel and Edgar, and then we have a third that's for the group. So first, um, for Edgar, uh, do you want to take maybe three minutes to answer the following? Um, how do you navigate assembly slash union organizing with seasonal farm workers in terms of maintaining momentum year after year with fluctuations in which workers return each season. I am based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, yeah, that's something that's very common in farm worker communities. Um, I think, I mean, for, for us, it's that we've, I think we've established a pretty solid base of, of workers and we've kind of mapped out um, where, um, where the farms are um, and have a like a pretty consistent basis of all the farms of and a presence. So no matter what the farms are, we're always like scouting and talking to workers and just even around the community, um, doing community organizing, you know, like even doing like service work type where, you know, workers like that get injured or need COVID information or anything like that, that lets people know that there's an organization there that's for farm workers, um, helps with kind of just keeping things like, just keeping our, our, our um, the organizational presence out there, you know, visiting people's homes, um, keeping the base solid, um, keeping the, 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 even on the people um, that are, not necessarily like you would say like union leaders, but just know about unions, like keeping them engaged and helping us with the organizing. So like every worker becomes an organizer, no matter what, no matter where they go, they'll have the resources and the skills to um, um, to take with them anywhere um, to organize workplaces or their communities and how we can create a network um, and of support for, for all those folks. So yeah, just, I guess just like constant on the ground base building and organizing. Thank you. Um, okay, and for Denzel, um, the question is, I'm curious about how you use assemblies to hold elected officials accountable and break through their political posturing. Are you getting them there in the room listening to policy proposals they all come up with? We've been thinking about how to get the electeds to be accountable to assemblies in Boston. 
Yeah, no, thank you for that question. I, I And I'm actually uh, really excited to answer this because um, in the previous, this year, um, during our um, mayoral and city council uh, electoral um, or elections, um, we were able to unveil uh, the uh, policy agenda that had been created in our assemblies um, over the past two, uh, two and a half years. And part of what we did was um, as an assembly, we established and uh, created uh, candidate discussions across the different districts um, for them to come to us, right? So instead of encouraging our assembly to go into spaces that were curated by particular candidates or by the establishment of some sort, we said that we would create this space and we would invite the candidates to come and talk to assembly members and the greater public. And so part of, um, and we were able to get nearly um, 100% participation. Um, we were actually able to get uh, candidates from different part of the districts. We were able to get all of the mayoral candidates to show up. And when they showed up, it wasn't just a matter of them as a matter of fact, they didn't really get a chance to do their political posturing because the orientation of the um, sort of candidate forums were shaped around the policy agenda. And so the questions that were asked of them were one, whether or not they even took a look at the policy agenda that was released. And that alone exposed so many candidates, right? Because that's a hard yes or no. Um, and so, and then from there, when we were able to engage them about particular policy demands, um, they had no time to create some sort of clean, non-answer answer, um, with response to our policy demands. Either they had a response that we could then critique and, and challenge, or um, they had something that was in, uh, in alignment, right? And people were able to see this live and record it. Um, and so um, what we didn't realize was that this had kind of set a precedent in the city because people, um, sort of more liberal uh, advocacy organizations, they did candidate forms, they didn't necessarily come with very particular policy agendas, let alone by their base or anything like that. And they would just let the candidates talk. And so now this sort of created this sort of new uh, thing where people were like, wow, we can actually ask candidates questions based on our collective policy demands and challenge them on it. And so we have public record of how they responded to our policy demands. So after the election, we can look at their voting track record and say, hey, you said you aligned with this and you either did or did not do that. And so that that was how we were able to to create some accountability. Thank you. Um, OK. So now we've got a lot of questions coming in. And so Marissa, I am gonna give you a hybrid question. Uh, and you can yeah, use three minutes movie to, to take a stab at it. But um, for all other panelists, feel free to drop resources in the chat as it relates to this question. Um, do you have a resource you'd recommend to practice the assembly process and work through common issues? So that's kind of question one. Um, and the second, I think, gets at the the interpersonal, really human side of that process, right? So um, to summarize that question, how do you deal with, with people, trauma, problematic behavior, um, boundaries, so on and so forth in that process of practicing assembly? Sure. So this resource, I mean, there, there are many resources <laughs> on how to you know facilitate meetings and how to structure things. Um, I mean, I I learned from from Lisa and Starhawk, so I, you know, I use their material for a while. Um, and certainly in Occupy we documented everything. And then the documents themselves were living documents. So they're they're in process um, and being adapted as new people came. Um, so all all of that is available. Um, you know, Mac has uh, on its website all the organizing documents um, so people can look at those and you know it's transparent in that way um, 
I, yeah, I guess I've also done facilitation trainings. <laughs> there are many, uh, I'd be happy to share, you know, materials from, from trainings um, if folks are interested in that. But uh, this gets at the larger question of political education, um, how to balance doing education in, you know, more horizontal setting. And uh, for me, it's actually much easier <laughs> to do it in a, in a horizontal setting as opposed to, you know, a hierarchical institution. Um, I, I do both, you know, I work in hierarchical institutions like for, for a living. Um, and then I do, you know, the horizontal uh, educational work um, for fun, you might say. Um, and yeah, people are much more engaged um, when you're not trying to have power over them. <laughs> It's kind of basic, but you know, but true. I mean, I can I can say from experience that you know, not grading them or having this kind of you know uh, authority over them um, or that particular kind of authority uh, makes it easier to have conversations. And yeah, um, and I and I guess I mean it also rotates. So like within Mac, for instance, we have these care assemblies. Um, we restructured so we don't have a general assembly. We have a care assembly instead of the general assembly. And that includes um, like a martial arts training at the beginning, um, which is kind of basic. And if people want to follow up and you know work in small groups to to get more trained, they can. Um, but we start with that, and then we have um, kind of a, a political education block with facilitation or some other relevant topic. So like the last couple of assemblies have been Palestine oriented because that's you know what what people are really um, wanting to do things around now. Um, we've had squatting, you know, talks before we've had house, housing related talks, different talks um, that are planned by MAC members. So anyone who comes through the care assembly and the organizing assembly and has been around for say three months or so, they become a member of MAC, right? And then they can contribute themselves to, you know, doing this political education. So the way of delivering it is is horizontal in the sense that like everyone has knowledge, um, but also the the process of becoming a facilitator, doing the education, leading it, you know, um, that's something that anyone can step into. And we're very clear about how how you how you end up there, um, how you end up in that position. Um, so yeah, that's on the education piece. And then the the question about problematic behavior. Um, yeah, I mean, we also, uh, learning from Occupy, <laughs> have an accountability team. Um, so, and, you know, accountability in, in a larger sense, not just um, dealing with sexual assault and harassment, although, you know, that is something that, that we deal with, but, you know, dealing with, um, you know, with racist behavior that comes up or ableist behavior um, and, you know, trying to be as intentional and prefigurative as possible in, in the way that we relate to each other. Um, and then if people are not willing to, to engage, <laughs> um, then, you know, they, they can't be part of the organization. It's just, you know, that, that clear. Um, we've only had a few instances of having to ask people to leave. Um, and they've been relatively drama free. I mean, I, yeah, certainly compared to, <laughs> to Occupy days, um, it's a lot easier, I think, with Mac, because we have these structures in place and intentions set. Um, yeah. I hope that answers the hybrid. Yes, yes. Thank you for taking the hybrid. Um Denzel had a quick thought. So maybe Denzel take um a moment and then we'll give Michael um um uh, a, a little while to reply to a question of his own. Yeah, yeah. So I will try to answer that in sort of a hybrid manner. Um so I think with with regards to the uh grappling with the tension um we we are very clear from the beginning that our assembly is not a neutral space right um and so when we organize the assembly we uh organize it around four different uh political pillars as we call them um we're a pan africanist um space we are a a space that embraces solidarity economy and aspires to practice those things. Um, we we hold on to tenets of Black queer feminism, and we're prison abolitionists, right? And so those are the those are the 
uh, spaces that um, or the values or tenants that that guide um, and inform the space. But with that, um, that allows us we, we also are very intentional about holding people where they are. Right. Um, and so we recognize that our, our our people come with various uh, influences, various political uh, uh, ideologies, various um, sort of vantage points um, in the space. And so we also are equally as intentional about holding those space and engaging in principled struggle. Right. And so this directly ties into how we handle traumas, too, because we also ground the space in uh, some community agreements, right? And these are some things that we have collectively um, over time as an assembly uh, developed, and, and, but some of it was also informed by the political pillars that we intentionally used to establish the assembly, right? And so part of it, part of those agreements involve um, naming um, how we're to treat each other, um, uh, naming the sort of limitations of the space right so naming so you know it's less about someone says something that is or, or does something that is problematic um and then becomes self-aware self-corrects or is even open to feedback but it's it, it then becomes this uh litmus test of or question of okay is this a a a, a, a moment where we're, there's continual harm right um because we all engaged in Things that, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we 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 harm. But the question is, what is the sort of like next step beyond that, and that determines our response. Um, and it's been an experiment. It, it definitely hasn't been a uh, an exact science, um, but a lot of it is rooted in this idea that we're here to um, struggle with each other in this space. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, great. And then Michael, you'll you'll take our last question before we wrap up. Um, the question is, I'm curious about how you, um, you know, take you generously, all of us here, uh, grapple with the tension of holding assemblies that value each person's voice and also incorporate political edu political education. Um, that's been shaped by the assembly's organizers specifically. Yeah, that's great. In some ways, it goes with uh, along with what Marissa already said about education. Um, and yeah, and in fact, I wanted to just to in part, I think, in line with this, extend some things that Marissa was saying. That that one of the things around education, I think, that one first has to recognize is how there's a kind of collective intelligence and a, and even a production of theoretical production that happens in movements collectively. You know, it's not just like intellectuals over there think and activists just act, you know, like there's a kind of, and rec uh, yeah, production of theory, a production of concepts, a production of ideas that happen collectively in movements. And so there's, you know, part of the educational question I think is recognizing that kind of, um, intelligence that happens collectively in the group you know seeing that as something that's as valid as what's happening you know in the libraries or in the or in the um university classrooms i mean i do think i i also think you know books are important uh maybe i have self-interest in that but um but i think negotiating this relation like recognizing the importance of the thought that happens together collectively in movements and negotiating that relationship with um, study, you know, study a, a book seems like a really uh, important. I mean, the question's asking how do we, uh, you know, was was asking how do we manage that? I'm not exactly sure how we manage that. Um, I just think that they're both important. We have to recognize that they're they're done in different registers. Yeah. So I guess I'm adding to you know, I mean, Marissa was talking about the the maybe even the horizontality of the of the space i'm also thinking about the two registers of of learning and that they and that they have to we have to find ways of of bringing them together yeah so that in some ways directs relates directly to the question right that you just that you just posed about the tension between each individual voice and the 
and even the necessary hierarchy. I think that I think it's the collective voice that that one has to like. We have to think about what what emerges and recognize what emerges from the discussions within the movement or within the assemblies as valuable, and and re yeah, recognize it in its own particular languages. You know, its own particular terms. I, I didn't quite answer the question, but um, I do think this question about education considered quite broadly is key. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is just, it's been an incredible panel. Uh, there's so many more things I think to say. And um, I, I also just want to um, offer because we have, you know, Ray and um, Emma who have been helping us with translation and uh, sorry, with interpretation. And so also want to thank them. Um, and we, we are going to officially close right now. So Ray and Emma, thank you so much. Alejandro, thank you so much. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to keep you much longer. So thank you again. Um, I want to close. I also want to say, I think that there's more questions. There's not an expectation that the panelists, you, you don't have to stay longer, but if you are interested in order to sort of address some of these questions, I will keep this open for a little bit so that you know we can um, get to folks' questions. But just to say really quickly before we do that, um, uh, thank you. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you for the interpreters. Thank you for the tech folks. Uh, we will have a recording available. We'll also have a transcript available. So all of those folks that were very sad about their otters being booted out, uh, there will be a transcript available for you to download on the website. If you could please share your feedback. Um, feedback is a gift and it'll help us to make sure that we are you know, meeting what people are interested in and what your needs are um, by going to sabcat.org forward slash assembly panel. Um, and then you can sign up for our email list and support our efforts if you have the resources also on our website. And I wanna do a plug that we do have um, an, a panel coming up next year on Valentine's Day um, around the topic of intercommunalism. I think Denzel name dropped uh, Dr. Newton earlier. We've been doing a study group about the concept, the theory and co uh, practice of intercommunalism um, in Los Angeles. Um, and so we are going to explore that theory. We've been going back and reading Descartes and Kant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we're going we're gonna, to um, explore that theory a little bit more, as well as historical and contemporary practice among the Panthers and also today. Um, so our speakers include Delio Vasquez, who wrote an excellent introduction to uh, to a, a speech that um, Huey P. Newton gave on intercommunalism that was published in Viewpoint magazine in 2018. And it will be facilitated by our intercommunalism research fellow, Kazembe Balagoon. So that is uh, February 14th. And we are still doing the study group. So if you are interested in political education, we welcome you all to join us. I just dropped the link for the study group in the chat window. So. Um, Again, want to thank everyone. If you need to, you know, uh, if you need to leave us, that's totally fine. If you would like to stay, I will be here a little longer and keep the space open if folks want to share or address more questions. Thank you, everyone. I have to go, unfortunately. Bye. So I don't know, Edgar, um, I don't know if you wanted to also jump in on, I think you were one of the first folks to kind of do the round, uh, Ray and uh, and uh, and Emma, and uh, I don't know if Alejandro is still on with us, but, you know, please don't feel like you have to stay. You know, I we really appreciate, uh, we really appreciate your assistance. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Um, Do you want to? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I can stay for a couple more minutes. Um, I think uh, to the question, I think it was about like problematic behavior. I can't remember the exact wording. Can't find it now. Um, but I know I don't know if this like really addresses the question, but 
we've been we what we've been taught about how to open up our spaces is with using like the mystica where we bring in like the spiritual uh along with the com the political and the artistic um into the the space to open up everything so like using the mystica as a, a place where um we kind of like just from the get-go already like set like a tone of what's expected from everybody that's going to be participating that it's you know you know it's gonna be debate but it's also gonna have a lot of um you know there's gonna be culture and music and food and um singing whatever people want and can to feel comfortable and participating so we try to set that tone from the get-go um whenever i think there's been maybe like issues that have come up the group that it tries to get um resolved as uh as a group um uh and also you know if need be just do like a one-on-one -on -one with an individual or if it's just one person um to see what's what's going on but yeah i just find like using like the mystica to open up kind of like puts our our hearts and our minds like in a good place to start off with Um, Yvonne, I think you're muted if you're <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Probably what I had to say was not that interesting anyway. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say thank you, Edgar. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like Denzel and uh, Michael also had to he head out. Um, Mason, I don't know since, you know, thank you so much for joining and helping with tech. Did you have anything you wanted to share? And then maybe, uh, maybe we'll just go back to Edgar again, one more time, and then we'll close out. Um, I have so many questions, but I feel like I will just extend us on forever if I, uh, throw them out there um but it was really wonderful getting to listen to you all and um edgar i hope we can talk more about this uh in the future okay uh thanks mason abel any last thoughts yeah um i mean i've just been looking through the questions that came in um, I think there are broadly three themes, you know, facilitation and the mechanics of assemblies, um, assemblies as they relate to capitalism or building alternative economic power, and then questions on really power differentials in a, a political geography, a neighborhood, or even within the assembly um, itself. And I, I, I think from the panel, um, and from the questions as well, uh, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, um, this, you know, 90 minute talk, um, with, uh, more, more hope for assembly as a tool, really, a, yeah, a strategic tool in, in building radical municipalism. So this was very cool. And I learned a lot from the questions and from the panelists. So thanks. Thanks, Abel. Um, Edgar, you want to close us out? No, I I actually just really quick. I think I do want to stress the need for political education and more spaces like that. So you know the this these kinds of presentations and just gathering with friends and coworkers or whatever and just talking about politics and like theory and just whatever you know just to get conversations going is is really important. You know to to really. Um, get context and analysis and um, yeah, just that kind of dialogue and those thoughts to like train your brain. I mean, it took me a long, long time to really kind of 
capture a lot of the things that are happening and why they happen. Um, um, so, you know, to understand systems and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's really good to have that political education um, component tied to, um, to the, the movement building as well. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, so good to see you. Um, thank you, everyone who's uh, stayed until the, the very end for um, 11 extra minutes. Um, we will see you all again on February 14th, if not sooner. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday and a happy new year. Thanks for joining us today.